and thanks in advance for listening. I'll try to be pretty brief um, because I was told you guys, uh, this group has lots of questions. So um, before I talk about you know secret data, I wanna take a step back and I should also qualify, I'm not a tech person. I'm, uh, I'm only a data person by journalism standards, which means I'm not afraid of a number, unlike many other reporters. Um, but yeah, as Stephen mentioned, I am uh, an investigative reporter, worked at the Sun-Times for about the last uh, year and a half, and I was at the, uh, the Reader for the better part of a decade before that. Um, you know, I, I, I consider myself actually a politics person, over the, but over the last few years I've written more and more about criminal justice for many reasons, one of which, which I think is just it's one of the issues of our time. And I just wanted to take a step back for a second. Um, a few years ago, I was going to a lot of community policing meetings, CAPS meetings around the city. Um, I still try to go to some now and then. It's a great way to just go to, uh, for a, a journalist to go to a different neighborhood and just hear what involved residents are concerned about. But if, has anyone ever been to a CAPS meeting? All right, a handful of people. Usually what happens if you go, and I actually encourage everybody to go if you live in the city of Chicago, even if you don't, I guess you can go because they're open to the public. Um, but one of the things that happens is the police officer who's sort of designated as the uh, liaison to the community usually hands out sort of a, stat, you know, a, a paper that summarizes all the reported crimes that happened in that particular police beat. And I noticed when I would go to a bunch of different meetings, it didn't matter which part of the city I went to, that every single time the leading arrest the, the, the number one reason that people were arrested was for possession of marijuana. And so this just, this just struck me. Um, you know, a, f a few months later down the road, a, a reporter from another news organization would accuse me of working very diligently to try to make the world safe for potheads. Um, that wasn't my intention, I swear, although that would be a fine side effect as far as I'm concerned. Um, if, if all this keeps going forward. But this, this really got me interested. I don't have to tell you guys that um, if you th we've, we've heard, all of us have heard a lot of chatter about the war on drugs, this big, huge thing, but the misdemeanor possession of marijuana, small amounts of marijuana, um, usually uh, half an ounce or less, this is sort of the lowest level offense, uh, lowest level of drug offense. And I started looking to it. Now, this was in like, 2011. Back at that point in time, in order to get information like this from the police department, you of course had to submit a freedom of information request um, under the state's open record law. And it's, you know, probably a lot of you guys have done it, are familiar, I don't want to, you know, talk under your level of knowledge, but very briefly, you usually just write a letter, it can be, I have sort of a formula, I've been doing this for a long time, and you just basically say, hey, this is what I want, I want this kind of information. Now back then, you know, it would take the police department several weeks, and then they would respond. If they didn't tell you, forget it, buzz off, they would respond by emailing you like a PDF with a bunch of numbers, uh, which of course is incredibly annoying. Um, but made that work, and uh, I also figured out a way you can, um, everything that happens in a courthouse, of course, is a public record as well. But you can't just walk up and get a bunch of aggregate data. There, if anyone has ever tried to look, has any, let me just ask the question, has anybody ever tried to look up like information on a local or state level court case? Okay, like if you've gone over the Daily Center or I hope you've never had to go to 26 in California to the criminal courthouse, but if you have, if you ever looked up on one of the terminals, it's ridiculous. It's like a computer, again, I'm not a tech person, but I recognize these computers because they were the ones that I was taught you know, um, how to use a computer when I was in sixth grade. They're like, it's basically that, and I'm not even exaggerating, it's like been upgraded slightly the last couple of years, but not much. So it's almost impossible to get good information on an aggregate level about what's happening in the courts. So at that time, and to this day still, in order to get any information to find out, say, who's been actually prosecuted and who's been convicted of misdemeanor marijuana possession, you have to write a letter to the office of the chief judge of the Circuit Court of Cook County and asked the judge to authorize the Cook County court clerk, 
who's a different elected official, um, to release this information to you and explain why you want it. If you don't want to be charged exorbitant fees for getting this information, you have to remember to put a little note in there, I request a waiver because it's in the public interest, yada, yada, yada. Now, you know, I had to go through several at-bats, swings and misses before I uh, figured out how to do all this. So long story short, I ended up um, asking for, because it was such a pain to get any kind of detailed data from the Chicago Police Department, I ended up asking for who was convicted of misdemeanor marijuana possession. And I did end up getting records. I got a, a really messy um, Excel database, but it was usable. And the long story short, found out that there were about there were more than 20,000 people a year in the city of Chicago. Well, I don't know how many people, but there were more than 20,000 arrests in the city of Chicago for this one offense, carrying around a dime bag or some other small amount of pot. And this was, you think about everything you've heard about that's going on in the city of Chicago. This is the most, at that time, it was the most common uh, reason to be arrested was misdemeanor marijuana possession. So. I started writing about this. Um, I was at the Reader at the time. I started writing about it with um, my colleague at the time, uh, Ben Jarofsky, who's a longtime political columnist, a uh, great, insightful columnist on uh, mostly writing about Chicago politics. And we started teaming up on this together. We got a bunch of data, and we basically found the gist of it is on this uh, nifty little infographic. It's probably not that easy to see if you're way in the back. but. The bottom line is uh, not probably going to surprise you, unfortunately, but huge racial disparities. I'm not going to survey you all to see how many people have uh, gotten high in their lives, um, but it's a, it's a large, I know statistically it's a large majority, okay? And no matter what your racial or economic background is, it's still a sizable, a sizable number of people, and these numbers are pretty much the same across racial groups. So what we found, this was back in 2011, was that about 78% of the people who were picked up and arrested for uh, small, having, possessing small amounts of, of pot, they're not smoking it, they're not dealing it, they're just possessing it, 78% um, of them were African American. And at every point through the criminal justice system, that racial gap grew. So 78% of those arrested, 89% of those convicted, and then we later found out, it's not on this chart, we later found out 92% of those who were sentenced to any kind of jail time uh, were African American. So this is a story I've continued to report. I keep, every year I write some kind of an update, and um, in, in, in part, I think because of our reporting, in 20, uh, 2012, uh, Mayor Manuel got the city council, and I am phrasing it that way for a reason, because around here, the mayor usually gets the city council to do things. Um, there, are, there are places in this world where legislative bodies are independent, and they, they act like a separate branch of government. Chicago is not one of them. Um, so here, most of the time, uh, the vast majority of the time, the city council takes its cues from the chief from the executive branch, which is the mayor's office. So 2012, uh, Mayor Emanuel pressured the city council and they passed a very weakly written uh, decriminalization ordinance. Um, I could go on and on about that, but the thing that's in interesting and important, I think, for what I'm trying to say here is that uh, arrests for mar misdemeanor mar marijuana possession did go down. This ordinance gave police officers the option of issuing people a ticket uh, instead of arresting them if they were caught for, with, with a small amount of pot. Now, you may ask yourself, didn't the police officers always have an option of what to do with people they caught with marijuana? And the answer, of course, is yes. Police officers you know, always have leeway to decide, uh, I should say almost always have leeway, to decide what to do when they encounter, encounter someone they deem to be um, a criminal offender. And so, you know, were they catching lots of white people and letting them go? Were they uh, just simply um, somehow encountering, f you know, fewer white people carrying bags of marijuana or smoking joints in the park on a nice, pleasant, sunny day? Good question. Um, I should say at this point in time, I don't have any animus toward the police department as an entity. I certainly don't have animus toward individual police officers. Um, there's been plenty written about 
cops who do outrageous things. I've written very few of those stories in my life. I've never been that interested in it. I think they're very important stories. I'm more interested in the way the police, uh, police department works as a political entity because, you guys, ultimately the police department is run by the mayor of Chicago. And, um, you know, there's a whole debate about the level to which uh, this particular mayor micromanages the police department. But the truth is the police department is, uh, it's an, in, at least in its policies, is a politi political entity. Okay, so what I'm getting at is this option was given to the police officers in, encoded in law to ticket people instead of arrest them for marijuana. And what happened is, after a very slow start, the intended effect um, actually occurred, which is that there were fewer people arrested for marijuana. There was a big drop off in it, in fact. Um, and there was a a modest increase in tickets, of course. It went from none to some. Not very many people ticketed. Most police officers basically said, forget it. It's a pain in the ass to ticket people. Um, I have to fill out all these forms. It's, it's just amount, the same amount of work as an arrest, and I don't get um, all the, the upshot of an arrest. I don't get all the good parts of an arrest, which is you're seen as an aggressive officer, which is if it's someone you think is engaged in something more than just carrying around a bag of weed, then you can take them to the police station and squeeze them for more information. So when you issue them a ticket, you can't do any of these things, okay? Well, bottom line is arrests went for marijuana went down, tickets went up a little bit, um, but uh, there's still, and did I, was I smart enough to pull this up? No, I guess I wasn't. Um, Okay, so, but arrest, arrest for marijuana went down. One thing that did not happen, though, was this, uh, was this, what we called the grass gap. The grass gap remains firmly in place. I wrote a story last summer about this. While arrests are, are way down, the racial gaps are exactly what they were before this law went into effect, which is to say 78% of all those people picked up um, for misdemeanor marijuana possession were still, are, are still African Americans. Okay, now, you know, this, this, believe it or not, despite the accusation uh, from my fellow journalism skeptic, I really wasn't setting out purposely to make the world safer for pot smokers. Um, but this led me into a whole nother interesting realm, which is um, why are police pe stopping people for marijuana? Why is this happening? And talking to officers, they're like, look, Mick, we're not going out just trying to arrest a bunch of black people on the west side. That's where the violence is. So we're, we're just stopping people. We are stopping people in places where people are getting shot. We're stopping people in places where there are open-air drug markets. How would you like it if someone was dealing drugs, whether it's marijuana or heroin outside your front door? Well, I wouldn't like it very much either. This is what they're saying. This is why they stop. It. So, this is why there's so many uh, drug busts and why there's such a big racial gap. Well... You know, I, I, as I was talking to some people um, and doing some more work on this, uh, I, I came across something else that I, th I found kind of interesting. Um, this is a chart that shows arrests for, by Chicago police for parole violations, okay? Um, and you'll notice, of course, there were, I should stop, when someone is incarcerated, and you guys realize uh, whether there's a trend um, to lock them all up, which is what Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General, wants us to return us to, or if there's concerns about the levels of mass incar incarceration, which is what a lot of people have been talking about the last few years, whoever you lock up and send, put away in prison, like 90, whatever, 96% of them are going to come out at some point in time. There's, there are very few people who go to prison and never come out. So. Whatever politicians are saying, we need to lock people up, we need to give her tougher, longer sentences, they're all going to come out at some point in time. Now, of course, when they're released on parole, they're supposed to adhere to certain uh, rules, which only makes sense. I think most of us would agree if you're let out of prison, um, certainly if you're let out before your sentence runs out, you should, you should follow a few rules. And it ranges from... Uh, you know, you're not supposed to be doing drugs. Obviously, you're not supposed to get in trouble again, committing any uh, criminal offenses. But you're also supposed to watch who you associate with. 
So not only is it a rule of parole, but it's actually a state law that when you come out, you are not allowed to have contact with anyone else who's on parole or anyone else who is a street gang member, okay? Well, again, you may, you may think this is okay. Um, you're out on parole. Let's say you've been locked up for something. Let's say you were locked up on a, a more serious drug charge, went away to, to you know, Joliet or something. You came out. You know, we don't really want you hanging out with guys who are in gangs. I mean, that makes some sense. Okay, but who's in a gang? Who says who's in a gang? There's not a membership card. It's not like the ACLU where you get a membership card. Um, the definition of a gang member is set by the police department. They have a database, which I don't think anyone has ever seen, of people who are, they deem to be in gangs. And they say they collect this a number of different ways. They say when they stop people, some people just say, they said, one, one cop told me, you'd be surprised the number of people who, who are proud of it. They want to tell you they're in a gang. Other people, um, they pick up, and I'm told that, hey, I just live on a certain block. So the police say, that's a four-corner hustler block, so you must be a four-corner hustler. That's how you're going down in our gang database. The point is, this is, this is really broad and open-ended. The other point is, again, if I bring your attention back to this graphic. So... One thing that Rom did, I'll give him, I'll give him credit for one thing. Um, he created this online data portal, and I'm sure most of you guys know about this. The city has uh, this on, an online data portal. There's all sorts of data sets. Most of them I personally have never found to be tip, tip, terribly useful. Um, when he first created this, I heard it compared to opening up your desk drawers and just dumping everything out and putting it online. Uh, but there is some very useful stuff. So remember when I mentioned back in the old days I had to send in a FOIA to get a PDF of a bunch of really vague um, and, and sometimes messy data from Chicago Police Department. Well, now there's this great database on the city's data portal, which is uh, reported crimes. And it's got supposedly every reported crime going back to the year 2001. And there's all sorts of information uh, internal ID numbers, case number, of course, the date, time, uh, the block number, they don't give you the exact address, but they give you a block number, criminal code, types of, of offense, um, you know, whether it's a weapon, and then they break down specifics. And so the bottom line is you can use this for all sorts of stuff, and I do use it. Uh, I do use it. I use this regularly. So thanks, Rob. Uh, you, you are making it a little bit easier to keep track of what the CPD says that it is doing. Um, so I started noticing when I was going through um, police reports looking at people who've been picked up for marijuana um, and then did another project, this was really uh, depressing, looking at people who'd been murdered and what their, how they'd gotten to that point. And I kept noticing, I just saw the pattern over and over again, a lot of uh, young African-American men had been picked up for this offense that I'd never heard of before, for associating with a gang member while on parole. And I already tried to explain to you a little bit how I thought this was vague. But when I started looking at it, it really, the numbers were pretty eye-popping. So literally, like in the year 2011, there were only 13 people in the entire city of Chicago that whole year who were arrested for this. Um, and it started to climb up slowly, and then you had this explosion in 2014, and then in 2015 you had about 2,000 people arrested for this offense. It dropped off last year, like everything did, um, after the release of the Laquan McDonald videotape. There were arrests in every category dropped uh, way down, and people are debating why that happened. Um, but it started to climb up again this year, and this, this number, 932, is uh, an estimate based on the rate of arrest. And to confirm this, just to confirm the police data, I did that thing where I, I wrote to the chief judge and asked for convictions, and they showed basically the same pattern. The number is a little bit different, but they showed basically the same pattern. Um, and then the thing is, that really struck out at me, I was talking to uh, one of my police sources, and I mentioned this thing. He said, yeah, we use this as a way to get guys off the street because, you know, we can't pick them up for weed anymore. And sure enough, you look at these numbers. So the blue line, um, and again, I, I, I tried to explain to you I'm not a great tech person, so this isn't the most sophisticated graphic, but the blue line is uh, 
misdemeanor marijuana arrests. And you can see how that's really gone down. And it's, it's dropped most sharply after the, the uh, ordinance you know, started to get, uh, they, they really started to use it. And at the same time, obviously they're in much smaller numbers, but the arrests for parole violations have gone up. So this is just a tool. This is just a tool for uh, the Chicago police to, um, a reason they can arrest somebody. And I looked through dozens of reports, and there was, in, in most cases, there was no, there was nothing that prompted the officer, I should rephrase that, in many cases, there was nothing that prompted the officer to stop this person. They just stopped him. And then afterward, they said, oh, we found out he was on parole, and he's a documented gang member, so we locked him up. Other cases, it was a broken taillight um, or some other thing. We, there were a bunch of guys sitting on a stoop. We had reports that there, were, there was gang activity in the area, so we came over, we interviewed him, we found out they are on parole, we found out at least one of them, all you need is one of them, is a documented gang member, and then we can start arresting the guys who are on parole. So this is a tool that they're using. One other thing I will, I will uh, show you here, and then I'll, I'll start to wrap this up. Um, while this is going on, while I'm doing this, the ACLU um, of Illinois took a look at who was being stopped. Now, there's been a lot of national stories about stop and frisk. And usually when people talk about stop and frisk, they talk about the New York City Police Department. And there's this whole debate. New York, of course, has had this historic huge drop in crime from like 2,500 murders a year uh, 25 years ago, something around there, to like 300 murders a year. And Chicago, of course, last year had like 800 murders a year and were a third the size of New York. You probably know some of this. But, but the backdrop to this amazing drop in crime, which no one quite understands why it's happening, is that for a long time, uh, New York City police were engaging in what they called broken windows policing, arresting people for small stuff, thinking that if you, you crack down on the small stuff, then that would have a big impact and send a message that you're gonna, not going to tolerate the more serious stuff as well. Um, but even though New York got all the press for this, every big city police department had some version of a stop and frisk program, whether they called it that or not. In Chicago, they had what they called the contact card system. And that meant that every time the police were sent out and they, um, they stopped somebody on the street, they were supposed to fill out a contact card. It literally was like a little index card with their name, that gang affiliation thing I was talking about, if they had any, and supposedly the reason why they were stopped. Because, you know, I don't know how many of us in this room are constitutional law scholars, but you're supposed to have a reason to stop somebody. Even if you're a police officer, even if you're in an area that has been you know, barraged with violence. Um, whatever the intentions, good, bad, whatever your police supervisor says, whatever the mayor says, you know, I don't care what you do, bring the crime rate down. Um, I'm sure he says something like that, except with a lot more F-bombs. But whatever the reason is, you're, stop, you know, you're supposed to have a, a cause under law to stop someone, and then if you pat them down or frisk them, you know, you search their pockets or anything, you're supposed to have additional reason for that. So each phase of this, you're supposed to be able to document while you're doing. The ACLU found then, I think it was 2014, the summer of 2014, through their own FOIA requests, they found that there were more than 250,000 stops in that summer, just in that summer, 250,000 stops. And in most cases, there was either no reason stated for the stop, or there was a completely unconstitutional reason for the stop. Um, just didn't pass legal muster. So they worked out, they threatened to sue, basically. They worked out a deal with the police that uh, now CPD is supposed to be documenting these stops a lot better. They're supposed to be explaining why they're doing it. And, you know, the number of stops has dropped. And so what I did um, uh, a few weeks ago was to FOIA the police department and say, give me, um, they weren't going to give me everything, but I said, give me summary data, give me basically an Excel sheet showing me every single stop you made in 2016. Um, and I want to know the, the location, I want to know the race of the person, the, the, the cause of the stop, and so forth and so on. So got some, some interesting, interesting figures um, on this. And this is the total number of stops uh, for last year broken down. 
and the blue is the African-American portion. Um, now, this is the share of stops that involve the frisk. So, you know, first of all, as the person you decide to stop, then you decide whether you need to pat them down and search them a little bit more. And you'll see that um, uh, while the, the pie for African Americans is much larger, the share of the pie that ended up in a, in a frisk is also larger. And the Hispanic number was even larger than that, which, which surprised me a little bit. But basically, you know, if you're stopped, you're much more likely, um, if you're a person of color, you're much more likely to get frisked as well as stopped. And uh, the other thing, I don't, I don't have a chart here to show it, so you just have to take me on, on this one. But uh, the thing that's, that's really, I think, fascinating and troubling about this is that um, the number of stops that ended up with someone finding a, an illegal gun or, you know, hard drugs is almost the same across the board. So there's really no difference. It's not, uh, you know, there's justification given sometimes for racial profiling, but it doesn't yield, um, it doesn't yield any better results, no matter which racial group here, at least according to this data. Uh, the other thing is that a very small number of these stops and frisks actually yielded a gun, which is the reason that CPD says that they're stopping people. They, they either want to find illegal weapons or they want to discourage anyone from carrying an illegal weapon and with, you know, taking the risk that they'll be stopped for us and arrested for it. But I think it was like 3% of people who were uh, stopped um, ended up being caught with an illegal weapon. I'm going to wrap it up here, but there, there's one other piece of this puzzle. Um, what I'm trying to communicate to you is that, you know, this started in my interest in, oh, who's, gonna, who's getting caught smoking dope? And just following this through and with the help of, of data and lots and lots of FOIAs and lots and lots of uh, letters to the chief judge of the circuit court um, and then more FOIAs and more letters, trying to put together a piece of this bigger puzzle of how the police department are actually carrying out their jobs um, and, and what that might mean for how that might be so much perceived so differently um, different people in different neighborhoods in Chicago. Um, you may have heard over the last year the police superintendent or other officials in the police department talk about we know there's no, actually a very small percentage of people who are responsible for the gun violence in the city, and we know who they are. The superintendent, Eddie Johnson, has even given a number. There's about 1,400 people who are responsible for the vast majority of the violence. I think at one point in time, even gave a percentage. 1,400 people are responsible for 85% of the gun violence in the city. Now, that's, that's a striking thing on so many levels, um, if you think about it. And, and the, the thing I'm thinking about is, well, how do you know? Of course. And they've been happy to say over the last year, police, that they have this thing that they call the strategic subject list, which is, um, as they say, is a, comp is a computer algorithm designed by people at the Illinois Institute of Technology, which is analyzing a whole set of factors. Um, and then through this algorithm, it basically gives, assigns people a score. And those with the highest score, uh, it's like a, it was told, I was told that it's sort of like a credit score. So, um, but in this case, those with the highest score um, are the most at risk and that they are using that basically for law enforcement uh, to know who to keep track of. And they're also teaming up with social workers to go out to people. They write them letters and they do home visits to say, hey, look, we have you flagged as someone we think is in great danger of being, they call it being a party to violence, which basically means you're either going to be, um, you're going to be shooting somebody or you're going to get shot. That's, that's sort of what they think this computer algorithm, algorithm tells them if you have a high enough score. So they are using this, um, this computer algorithm to determine uh, not, not just which neighborhoods they go to, that's like old school now, and not just who to stop and frisk, but literally in some cases, whose door to knock on to talk to about, hey, we think you're in trouble. Um, I think that's fascinating. It creates a whole new set of questions. Um, it could be a good thing. They said that some people they've, whose doors they knocked on are, um, are accepting their, they go sometimes with social workers. They say people are accepting their offer of social services and help getting a job and stuff. Other people are, just are creeped out by it. I, a colleague and I talked to a guy on the west side last year who got a visit, and he thought that it was just the police spying on him. He said, 
there's no way. There's, I don't trust them. I never trusted them. There's no way I'm, I'm going to... I, I'm going to talk to him anymore. I don't, I don't want to hear from him ever again. Um, now, their view of him may be very different. They may see him as, a, as trouble in the neighborhood, which is why they were, they were knocking on his door. But the point is that decisions are being made about uh, the use of government resources, namely who to, uh, as it was put to me, who to surveil and who to offer help to based on a computer algorithm. And I think it's um, kind of the culmination of some of these other things that I talked about. So the next quest, and I hope to have a story out about this for you soon, uh, is to find out a little bit more about the st strategic subject list. We've been, uh, we, last, starting last summer, um, started submitting freedom of information requests, asking for copies of it and then stripped down copies of it, and, um, and we're still fighting to get more information about it. So stay tuned on that front. I talked way longer than I wanted to. Thank you for listening. Happy to have answer any questions any of you might have. I know you may not know, but if they generate the data for the people that they will ask questions with a biased intent, wouldn't that make the algorithm not work right? Because it's generated from the bias of the, the stops and the data that they're generating or creating by labeling people gangs and who they're affiliated with, like they're making their own not door knocking policy. That, that's a really good point because um, now they, they keep saying they've, they've been cagey about what exactly what factors go into this algorithm. But uh, you're exactly right. A couple of the factors that they've been out about is it's gang affiliation. And I just got done giving you my version at least, um, which, you know, please take with skepticism. I'm, I'm skeptical of everybody. But, you know, my version, of course, is that this is a real loosey goosey, you know, what is a gang member? Um, first of all, in this day and age, most cops working out on the street will tell you a gang isn't what it used to be. I mean, it's not like you cross the street and you go from Stones to GD territory like it used to be in the old days. Um, these things are very fluid on the street, even for, for people who identify as gang members. Now, that's, that's a small group, and the police have a much larger group that they think are in gangs. So you're exactly right. If one of the factors in this supposedly sophisticated data-driven law enforcement system is membership in a gang and affiliation with others who are members of gang, but then the whole definition of who's in a gang member is suspect or has question is questionable from the beginning, you're totally right. It's like, that's like kind of almost pseudoscientific, right? Um, and the same thing with arrests. I got done, just got done telling you the police, again, have their reasons for why they arrest people, but there are huge disparities in just even the lowest level offenses. And at one point in time, at least, narcotics arrests, including marijuana arrests, were part of this algorithm. So, you know, if, if you're, if you're a, a weed head who just keeps carrying it over to your friends to, to play Nintendo and you keep getting stopped, you are going to get a higher score, even if you're a, a low-level drug dealer. And... You know, you, you sell dime bags to, to, you know, to make a few bucks, you're going to get a higher score. And that may or may not be connected with the violence on the street, but that is part of, essentially, you're right. So I think what you're saying is, is this algorithm in some ways self-determining? And you can argue that there's certainly an element to that. You, you show in the stop chart the pie redistribution of, of race, and I wonder if have you compare uh, re relative, uh, uh, related to the total population of Chicago? Uh, for example, I know that the majority of the population is white, so those uh, per percentage will be even uh, narrower. Uh, so I don't know if you have analyzed in from that perspective or... Yeah, I actually did. Um, I did actually uh, with. Um, this isn't very. Uh, let's see, is that it? This isn't very appealing to the eye here. But when I was doing a breakdown of marijuana arrests, I did do it on a per population basis, just to look at arrest rates by community area, um, which are based on census tracts. So I downloaded all the census data. And then I, you know, crunched those numbers, and then did did a rate of arrests and a rate of ticketing, and a rate of both of them combined. Um, and, you know, the rates are just so much higher. In uh, this is this is ranked, I think, actually, 
by the total number of bus per thousand people. Um, and then you can see, so, you know, all the ones at the top, percent black, 91%, 90%, 96%, 84%, 90%, 95%, 95%, 94%, 91%, 41%. But that's uh, a majority Hispanic community. Um, the thing about studying criminal justice in Chicago, which is very sad, but it's very convenient for us, is that it's so segregated. I've lived here for a long time, so I just know which neighborhood's a black neighborhood and which one's a Hispanic neighborhood, and which one's a white neighborhood. And so you can almost do proxies for race by just where the neighborhood where stuff was happening. Um, if you bore down deeper, and I did this at one point in time, I don't have the data in front of me, but I actually found in a lot of um, even majority white neighborhoods, the percentage of African Americans was still higher than whites. So, uh, you know, uh, that, so that stands out. But I think your, um, your original question was, about the, the breakdown in Chicago is roughly a third white, black, and Hispanic. Those have shifted a little bit. I think the black population has dropped, the Hispanic population has leveled off, and the white population has actually grown over like the last 10 years. But it's roughly a third, they're, they're roughly even. There's, um, and so, you know, when you're talking about just in the terms of the raw numbers, I mean, you know, this is definitely not divided up into thirds. Now, again, I should be fair and say, the police departments say, um, we are more aggressively policing in areas where people are getting shot and killed. And that's what the public expects and that's what they want. And my intention in all this is, is uh, I'm not an enemy, I don't consider myself an enemy of the police department. There are those within the police department who see me that way, but I don't consider myself an enemy. I, my, my ultimate question is, what is the purpose of the police department? Um, if uh, we basically have certain areas that have been completely starved of resources, and then the major investment we make as a public is in law enforcement and the criminal justice system, that's, the, that's like, if not the most significant, certainly one of the most significant investments we make in the most impoverished neighborhoods in Chicago is in policing. Um, Police department has more than one fifth of the total city budget, more than a billion dollars just to the police department. No other city department comes anywhere close. So what I'm saying is this isn't about, you know, officer friendly or officer jackass deciding I'm going to go in and just arrest a bunch of punks. That does happen. I'm not going to say it doesn't. This is a policy. This is a policy to go into these neighborhoods and respond to uh, social problems by arresting, by stopping and arresting and locking up a lot of people. There are historic reasons for it, but that is where we are now. And if we want something different, then we need to talk about these numbers. We need to talk about why it's happening. That's my belief. Have you mapped this uh, spatially or geographically? Uh, because if, if you did layers of uh, where the arrests are, where the convictions are, where the parolees live, uh, where the gang members are, where the re-arrest, it, it would all lay up in the same neighborhoods. And so the, the Illinois law that makes it a crime to be associated with someone you live near, that makes sense, unless it's policy. No, you're exactly right. I mean, the sad truth, like I was saying a couple minutes ago about a city is segregated Chicago, all the maps are the same. Whether it's for lead poisoning, whether it's for poverty rates, whether it's for free or reduced lunch and CPS, or whether it's for arrests, or whether it's for murders, it's all the same. You know, the red zones are the African American neighborhoods, the pink zones are the Hispanic neighborhoods, and, and the lighter areas are the white neighborhoods. It's like, it's, this is why this is a, a sociologist and reporter city. I mean, it's, this, it's a terrible truth. Um, and I don't mean to sound cynical, but that is exactly it. To your specific point about the parolees, yeah, I mean, the biggest concentration of these arrests for associating with a parole member, uh, or associating with a gang member on parole is on the west side of Chicago, which is, has the biggest concentration, one of the biggest concentrations of parolees in the entire country, and it is the biggest concentration in the state of Illinois, and I've written about that separately as well. So, you know, um, even if you're off parole, it, there's a strong likelihood just walking to the store you're going to pass 
another ex-offender or someone that the police say is in a gang who may or may not be in a gang. I'm not going to say there aren't people who associate with gangs in these neighborhoods. Of course there are. But um, the, point that you're, the point you're making or that I'm interpreting you making is exactly right, is that um, you know, if you were to return, I live in Rogers Park, if you return to my community, it's much easier to as avoid one of these associations if you're trying to than it would be on the west side, for sure. You mentioned um, the secrecy, lack of access of this gang's database, and I'm sure other kinds of data sets. Um, in general, among the public, we, we know about the code of the code of silence among police that like prevents um, police officers from like testifying or disclosing things about misconduct and unjustified violence. Um, and uh, you also mentioned that you had a, you had contacts at the police um, who helped you understand the relationship between the decriminalization of weed and the parole arrests, parole violation arrests. Um, did you mean that you have contacts with people at the CPD who are helpful? What is your relationship like as a reporter? Like what kinds of things do they share? Is it feasible that we will ever have like a cop whistleblower? Well, all right, lots of questions there. Um, uh, first of all, um, there, let, let me be painfully fair and say that some of this, the police do have some justifiable reasons for keeping some information secret. I mean, if they have an ongoing investigation, of course, into uh, you know, a major heroin ring that's linked to a cartel or gun traffickers or, or just even to a, a murder case. I mean, or, or it doesn't have to be that, even that serious. I mean, uh, an investigation and process is, um, that kind of information is exempt under the FOIA, and, and I personally don't have a problem with that. The problem I have is that that and other exemptions are routinely abused to deny us information that should be public. And so we operate on some level of trust, of course. We don't have any choice. I don't have access to the police department's vaults. I don't have access to their computer system. So when they tell me these are what the numbers are, I, I, I go on faith that this, these are what the numbers are. Um, and that is true with everything I get officially through official requests with the police department. They have a, a, a large news affairs team. So, you know, I, I have the, the, the main guys at news affairs. They're on my cell phone. We text back and forth. I try not to make it personal. They try not to make it personal. We have what I think is a professional relationship. I often say to them and to other people, um, you may not like what I write, but I'm going to listen to you. I'm going to try to be fair. Um, again, the, the conclusions I reach based on my reporting and my data um, may be something that, that you don't see it that way. Fair enough, that's what my job is, to call it like I see it after a lot of work to try to get the facts right. Um, so I try to keep it professional with them. But beyond the official sources, like the guy I was talking about who told me about the weed versus parolees connection, that's one of a, a few, there are a few police officers I've gotten to know through the years that I will, whom I will contact on a regular basis and I'll say, I'm working on this, what do you think? Um, and they'll give it to me straight. And they'll, they'll, they'll kind of like kick me in the butt after a story that they don't think I got right, you know? There's one guy I've known for a, a long time who when I first started writing, you know, he was a, he was a, a source on this story in 2011, when I did an update to this story uh, last summer, five years later, he wrote me, he's like, I don't like this story. And I'm thinking to myself, dude, it's the same story that I wrote five years ago that you really did like when you were telling me in confidence that there was, you know, all drugs should be legalized, which by the way, I think the majority of police officers actually think that most drugs should be legalized, but whole nother issue. Um, so, but you know, it, t things are raw now, the police, a lot of police officers, um, including those who got in this, in, in that business to try to help people, um, they really do feel like they've been, they've been beaten up over the last year by people like me. And I don't see it that way, obviously. I don't see a demand for accountability and for open government. 
I don't see that as beating up on them as individuals, but that's how they see it. And again, I'm going to have to respect their view. So I'm, what I'm saying is I try to communicate with people. I definitely want to hear their point of view. What have I missed? The data is only the start of the story. Then you actually have to go talk to human beings. You have to go out to the neighborhoods. You have to find out how this really works. You look through police reports to see how it's documented. All sorts of stuff. But it's a really important piece for me to be able to talk to people who are in the know, including people I respect who try to do the job with integrity. What percentage of time when you're working on a story do you spend looking at the data versus talking to people on the street? It depends. It depends on the story. These stories I talked to you about were largely data-driven stories. Um, I get sick of numbers. I mean, I got into this to be a writer, and I got into this to be able to talk to people and tell human stories. So the way I look at it is when I, when I have a story that I want to... Um, I want to have sort of a, a backbone. There, there, there are two kinds of stories, I guess, that I try to write. One is sort of data-driven. Like, that's the backbone to the story. I get a data set, and then I, in my very unsophisticated way of, of doing pivot tables and playing around with Excel, um, I consider that like I'm interviewing this data. I'm asking it questions. The same way I would interview a human source. I want to find out, like, oh, OK, so, so where are the arrests happening? Oh, OK. So most of them are happening, you know, on the 51, the most happened on the 5100 block of West Madison on the west side, which is um, unfortunately known for a lot of open air drug sales. So I'll do an interview like that. But then there's another, uh, then even on those kinds of stories, I want to go talk to people. I want to talk to police officers. I want to talk to people in the neighborhoods. I, I like to talk to offenders. I mean, they're in the middle of this. They, don't, they know better than anybody else uh, when that's possible. It's not always possible for deadlines, complexity reasons, um, but I try to do that. The other kind of story is a narrative story, which doesn't necessarily start off with data. It may have some data at some point, but it usually starts off because I see something or I hear something like, that's an incredible story. Um, one quick example, I wrote a story a few years ago about a heroin ring on the west side of Chicago. And that started off, I saw a little blurb. In, at the time, I was at the Reader, and I had like um, this huge news hole, so I got to write magazine-length stories. Now I'm writing stories that are like 1,600 words long. This story was like 5,000 words long, so I had a lot more space to the, let the narrative unfold. But it started off, I saw a little blurb in one of the papers about this guy had been sentenced to prison for being uh, he was convicted of basically being the head of this heroin sales operation out on the west side. So I was intrigued. I was like, well, what's the backstory? And there are a lot of these cases like this. I just picked one of them, and I just zoomed in on it. And I, got, I read through like hundreds of pages of court records. I wrote to people in prison. I talked to their lawyers. I talked to uh, the head of the DEA in Chicago. I talked to the lead police guy who was in on the undercover investigation. And I had some time, as you can tell, um, as I'm just listing this stuff, I had some time to do this story. Um, so that's how I did it. And it came out as sort of, it was more of a story. It was like, it started, you know, it started with, uh, there was a shooting outside of the Rock and Roll McDonald's in 2008. Some of you have been around for a while, may vaguely remember this. Um, you know, this kind of cultural, landmark or at least tourist stop in Chicago, very well known. And uh, late one night, there were two guys who were shot outside this thing. One of them was killed and one of them survived. And that, that started off an investigation. The police um, not only investigated the shooting, but they investigated the, peop the guy who got shot and survived. I think he'd been on the radar for a while. And it turned out he was the head of this heroin organization on the west side of Chicago. So different type of story. I had a, a little tiny sprinkling of a couple numbers at the very end of the story, but that was more story just about, you know, that was a narrative arc. And um, I actually like writing those stories better, but I think for like public accountability, to get readers, you need to write narratives. For public accountability, you need hard, cold evidence like numbers. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Thanks.